So if that story doesn't make you cry? No, look, I don't cry. It's not a big deal, okay? No, it's not okay. <laughs> it's not okay at all. <laughs> You're dead inside. <laughs> hey, sweetie. Hey. <laughs> Chicken soup for the soul? There's no back to this couch. <laughs> Why are you reading this? You hate this kind of stuff. Yeah, I know. Well, I figured I'd give it a shot, you know? I mean, maybe one of those stories would make me cry, and then you wouldn't think I was, you know, all dead inside. Oh, that's so sweet. Now, Chandler, I don't care if you can't cry. I love you. Oh, that makes me feel so warm in my hollow tin chest. <laughs> Stop it. Stop. No, I mean, come on, seriously. Think about it. We get married, I'm up at the altar, and I'm like this. I won't care. Because I know that you'll be feeling it all in here. Yeah? Yeah. And if, and if we have a baby one day, and the doctor hands it to you in the delivery room, and you don't cry, so what? And, and, if, and if we take him to college, and we come home, and, and we see his empty room for the first time, and you got nothing, <laughs> won't matter to me. Okay. Well, I won't uh, worry about this anymore, then. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, if I die... <laughs> from a long illness, and you're writing out my eulogy, and you open the desk drawer, and you, you find a note from me that says, I will always be with you, and you still can't shed one tiny tear, <laughs> I know you'll be crying a river inside. Oh, I love you so much. We had lunch a couple of weeks ago with our friend Charlene and her new husband Dave Heiner who lives in Tehachapi and has for many years but Charlene knew him in Santa Clarita and uh, we knew Charlene in Santa Clarita. She's the one whose son-in-law Stan is on the prayer list because of his battle with non-Hunchkin's lymphoma. Uh, Charlene actually lived here in Tehachapi for only about a year but her mother was a longtime member of this church and uh, we knew Charlene, as I said, in Valencia. In fact, when I came to Valencia to look for a house, when the kids were finishing the school year in Washington, I stayed with Bert and Charlene. And the house that we found was in their neighborhood and they were some of our closest friends there. I played racquetball with Bert and he and I looked at virtually every piece of commercial property on the western side of Santa Clarita together to find a place where the church could put a building to allow for growth. Well, Bert had retired from a full-time sales job involving electrical engineering the week that I arrived. Uh, he was only in his early 50s, so not really retirement age, but Bert and Charlene had an H&R Block franchise, and they felt that that would provide enough income without his other job, and it would allow them a lot of freedom when it wasn't tax season. Well, then about two years after he retired, Bert was diagnosed with malignant melanoma. He had surgery to remove a tumor and then went through chemotherapy and then a type of immunotherapy that was new at that time uh, and then finally went through some treatments in Mexico that were nutrition based. But nothing worked for him and I got the news that Bert had died while I was at the Pepperdine Bible Lectures in Malibu in early May. Uh, I got in the car and headed back to Valencia and for the first time since I was a little kid I cried. It had been possibly 30 or more years since I had shed one tear. Uh, because like Chandler in the clip, I just didn't cry. But Bert was the first friend of mine who had died. Well, since my tear ducts were opened by Bert's death, however, it doesn't take that much to tear me up, as you may have noticed. Uh, even Hallmark movies, you know, that are extremely predictable. Uh, bring tears to my eyes at all the times that they want them to come. Uh, and so in, in one of my high school assembly programs, uh, there is a segment about empathy. And at the end of that program, I always say, I want you to take away three words and they're all pathy words. The first is apathy, which is basically feeling nothing or not caring, you have no feeling. Well, obviously we don't want that. A better one is sympathy. 
Uh, and this is feeling sorry for someone who is suffering. Well, that's good, but what we really need is empathy. And empathy is when you actually feel what someone else feels. And what Jesus wants as he faces his trial and crucifixion is a little empathy from his friends. He wants his closest friends to feel with him. And so now we'll review what has been happening uh, most recently. And then let's see how they do with this empathy thing. So going back to uh, Matthew 26, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. He was talking about himself, of course. And then on down in verse 14, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And then on down in verse 20, When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, You have said so. And then in verse 26, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, uh, here they are, are all at the Mount of Olives uh, after singing a hymn. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And uh, they still have those disturbing words that were spoken at the Passover meal in their heads. And so then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Now sometimes we say that we like Peter, I think because of all of his blunders. They make us feel better about ourselves. In fact, we might even think, you know, at least I'm glad that I've never uh, made a fool of myself as often or as extremely as Peter did. And when we think like that, we need to rethink our thinking. Uh, look at the next line. Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. I don't think I'd say that not only am I more disciplined and clear thinking than Peter, I'm more clear thinking than any of Jesus' disciples during his lifetime. Uh, it's fair to say that there is probably not one of us who would not have said and done similar things that now seem so far off target, you know, or even worse things. Okay, so the emotions here are pretty ripe, but if we remember how clueless his followers seem to be much of the time, what Jesus does next seems a little surprising to me. He takes his three closest friends with him hoping that they can empathize with him as he faces the horror that lies ahead. Now, I find it a little surprising because every step of the way, they have denied that he will even suffer in the ways that he knows he will suffer. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell, his, uh, fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Now the way I see this is I would assume that if it were possible, God would have given Jesus what he asked for. He said, if it is possible. And so I take it that there was no other way to accomplish what we needed and what God needed in order to fulfill the two sides of his nature. God is love, God is merciful, God is forgiving, but God is also just. God is righteous. The unjust suffering that Jesus was already beginning to suffer was not just a dramatic way of highlighting God's nature. It wasn't just a great story. I believe it was the only way to fulfill his nature. So then Jesus returns to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, Peter, James, and John were all with Jesus, and so he asks why they could not stay awake with him one hour, and he uses the plural, uh, you guys, or you men, or if you're a southerner, y'all. Uh, but he addresses the question to Peter. Now, knowing Peter, I kind of think that if he had had a bad or a lame answer, he would have given it, any answer. So I guess that for once, Peter has no words. I think they're all ashamed of themselves, and uh, they know that they have no defense. And I'm sure that they feel sympathy, but they have failed to have empathy and feel with him. But Jesus does know their hearts, and he gives them credit for their willing spirits while challenging them to do better. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Uh, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation or pray that you will not fall into temptation. I believe the NCV uh, gives a better translation. Stay awake and pray for strength against temptation. The spirit wants to do what is right, but the body is weak. Uh, in the newer NIV, there's an added word, so that you will not fall into temptation. It implies, that sort of implies that if they will just pray, they will not fall. So that. But praying that we will not fall seems to me to be a little bit different from praying so that we will not fall. Uh, the truth is, not praying will often result in failure. But praying will not always result in success. You understand that? Uh, sometimes it is necessary for us to fail and to suffer just as it was necessary for Jesus to suffer, even though he was not the one who failed. But it is important to know that Jesus did not give up on prayer himself, and it sounds like he changes the prayer just enough to suggest that he felt that, you know, the answer was, no, it is not possible for this cup to be taken from you. That sounds a lot like his first prayer, but listen to the difference. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. The first time Jesus prayed, if it is possible. The second time he prayed, if it is not possible. Maybe I'm splitting hairs, but I think there's a real difference. He goes more directly to may your will be done without even mentioning his own desire. So meanwhile, how are Peter, James, and John's bodies doing? Uh, they are, are they any stronger than before? Uh, when he came back, no. He again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them, this doesn't even wake them up this time it sounds like, and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Back to that problem of prayers not always leading to success. Uh, I think that what Jesus said about their willing spirits eliminates probably the possibility that Peter, James, and John did not pray what he told them to pray when he 
told them to pray that and then went off the second time. I feel certain that they did exactly what he told them to do until they didn't, until they fell asleep. But was God not willing for them to stay awake with Jesus? What Jesus is teaching us by his actions and attitudes and what their prayers, my assumed prayers, uh, teach us is that prayer is not a vending machine where uh, we put in the coin and we choose our product and it falls into place for us. But prayer is the best one thing we can do as long as our actions and attitudes are consistent with what we think we need in keeping with God's will. That middle caveat means that we can't just pray and then lie back and wait for God to do what we ask when there is something we can do. If there's an action we can take, then we take it. If there's nothing we can do, then we wait for God's answer uh, by being patient and saying, may your will be done. So Peter, James, and John no doubt prayed what he told them to pray until they fell asleep again. This time he just leaves them sleeping and uh, prays the same prayer. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. In one of our Zoom meetings, Blair noted that Jesus prayed three times for the cup to be taken away and Paul prayed three times for the thorn in his flesh to be taken away. Uh, and so I thought, well, maybe those are examples that we might do well to follow when we are praying, uh, at least for something for ourselves. Uh, if it were a law or even a rule, I think God would have laid it out. So don't go away thinking that Mark said to stop praying after three times. I'm just suggesting that when it's a personal request, like Jesus' request or Paul's request, maybe there's a point at which we need to consider whether God has answered our prayer. Uh, maybe we need to look for the answer instead of continuing to say the same thing over and over. The number three represents wholeness or harmony in scripture. Uh, the number seven also represents completion uh, similarly, but over and over again, you see threes in the Old and New Testaments. In 1 Kings uh, 17, Elijah cried out to God when the son of the widow of Zarephath had died and stretched himself over on the boy three times and God heard his prayer and he returned the boy's life to him. Uh, Jonah was in the big fish three days. Uh, Satan tempted Jesus with three temptations. Jesus will be in the grave three days. The Holy Spirit will let down the sheet with all of the formerly unclean animals three times to convince Peter that Gentiles were not unclean. And Jesus took three friends with him to the garden, uh, same three friends that he took up on the mountain. So maybe when we don't get the answer we want and then we pray again for the same answer and then we pray again for the same answer, then it's time to say, God's got this. Now, when we're praying for others, I don't see the same principle uh, possibly at play. If we pray for Ukraine or we pray for Donna Ricker's ongoing battle with Parkinson's disease or we pray for wisdom and insight when it comes to ways to serve our community and save others who are lost and needing to be rescued from darkness. You know, I think that is when the line from Romans 12, be faithful in prayer, should overrule neglect or laziness or apathy. So don't use the three time idea, which is not a rule, but an idea as an excuse to quit praying and quit caring and quit applying the law of love and good works. But back to Jesus and his friends. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12 arrived with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings rabbi, and kissed him. Now, what would you call Judas if you were Jesus at this point? 
You know, I can think of a lot of possibilities, but, uh, you know, Judas' own name has become the ultimate insult for someone who has switched sides. Uh, you know, when you call someone a Judas, you are placing him or her at the level of pond scum. So I can think of a lot of things I might call him at this point, but friend is not one of the things I would think of. And yet, what does Jesus call him? Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Now, I've pointed out the irony and the dangerous claims of a certain song that we sometimes sing, uh, I'll be a friend of Jesus. And I, I, you've got to be careful when you, you know, you question songs because it's usually someone's favorite. Uh, but it was written by John Johnson Oakman Jr. He wrote over 3,000 songs in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So I have no doubt that he was a better man than I am. And many of the songs that he wrote were wonderful. Count Your Blessings, Higher Ground. But I, can't just, I just can't imagine what he was thinking when he wrote these words. They tried my Lord and Master with no one to defend. Within the halls of Pilate, he stood without a friend. I'll be a friend to Jesus. My life for him, I'll spend. I'll be a friend to Jesus until my years shall end. The world may turn against him. I'll love him to the end. And while on earth I'm living, my Lord shall have a friend. Now, the Gospels and Acts do not make Peter into some kind of infallible hero who we should worship. So I don't have a problem with thinking, you know, that we're sort of similar to Peter in a lot of ways at a lot of times. Uh, but actually the Gospels almost seem like they make him into a buffoon sometimes. But Peter was not a buffoon. And he was one of, you know, about three leaders in the church after Jesus uh, returned to heaven who stands out as being strong and courageous. Uh, he was clearly chosen by Jesus himself because of some great leadership qualities. And he finally learned to use those in powerful ways. What I'm getting at is this, why in the world would I be foolish enough to claim that I would be a better friend to Jesus than Peter or any of his other chosen apostles? At the end of last week's lesson, we even talked about how we are betrayers like Judas when we follow the self-centered lifestyle of the enemy after we have already pledged to follow the sacrificial spirit of Jesus. We're not always better friends even than Judas, much less Peter. So it's a good thing to try to be a friend to Jesus, of course, but if we're going to sing a Johnson Oatman Jr. song about friendship, uh, let's sing about the kind of friend Jesus is, not the kind of friend we should try to be, but will fail to live up to. Uh, here, are the, here are the lines from that song. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. The reason Jesus could call Judas his friend was not because of who Judas was, but because of who Jesus was and who he is. And when Jesus called him friend, how do you think that made Judas feel? It had to cut him to the heart. In Judas's mind, it was too late for him to be saved from his own guilt. I firmly believe, however, that even Judas could have been redeemed. He was the one who decided he was beyond redemption, not Jesus. All right, so what do we need to internalize from this lesson? Well, this is really the lesson for us. In these words, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is what Jesus wants, and this is what we all need. So let's remember that prayer is the best one thing we can do as long as our actions and attitudes are consistent with what we think we need, what we are praying for, in keeping with God's will. So let's pray, and if you're taking communion,
uh, we're praying as we remember uh, the body that was broken for us. Our Father, we are so thankful that Jesus is our friend, even when we are very bad friends at times. Uh, and Father, we pray that we will pledge to be better friends. Uh, we will intend to be better friends. We will pray uh, so that we will not fall into temptation. Father, the greatest temptation is just simply to be selfish and think about our own needs and desires rather than the needs of others. And we are so thankful that Jesus was not selfish and did not think of his own needs and desires instead of ours. And we pray, Father, that as we take this bread that represents the body that he gave up for us and was broken for us, that we will resolve to be more like him as we move forward in this life. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And let's pray again as we take the cup. Our Father, we thank you that as Jesus uh, accepted the cup that he did not want to accept, uh, that we will, when we take this cup, remember that that is what it represents for us too, that it is a bitter cup in many ways. Uh, it is glorious to live in this world in uh, Jesus' uh, body and, and to have his spirit in us, but at the same time, it is often very difficult and we have to sacrifice our desires and wants and needs uh, when there is a time that others really need us and we really need his spirit that was given up as, he, as his blood was shed. And we thank you that we can take this cup that represents the reality that he has given us of that spirit as we pray in his name. Amen. So stay tuned for some songs that uh, will really shed more light on these issues and have a great week. <laughs>